Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Anthony Camarota, and it's a real privilege for me to be part of this NCVH educational series. Uh, and I've been asked to evaluate the trials and patients who have acute deep venous thrombosis and how we put into perspective the information we've learned from the trials to patient care. And more importantly, when do we take certain patients to the cath lab or the interventional radiology suite to mechanically uh, get rid of their clot. And I hope that I'll shed some light on that today. And this is my disclosure. I was on the steering committee for the ATTRACT trial. But first of all, let's take a look at what it is we're dealing with. And this represents a very graphic example of a young woman who had a big operation on her spine. And you can see the hardware on the frame on your left. And she developed a swollen, bluish, discolored, painful leg, classic of phlegmasia cerulea dolens. And just having had an operation on her spine six days earlier, she was not a candidate for thrombolysis. So we operated on her and performed a surgical venous thrombectomy. And you can see the common femoral vein with its transverse venotomy and this current jelly-like clot that begins to uh, be visualized. And then after the thrombectomy, you can see the enormous amount of acute clot that we removed from the oleofemoral and femoral popliteal venous segments. So this is what we're trying to eliminate when we're dealing with uh, patients with iliofemoral deep venous thrombosis. And we can see that a photograph at three years after follow-up, she's doing very well. Her legs are essentially normal, including the involved leg. She works as a hairdresser, so is on her legs all the time. She has no edema and normal valve function. And obviously, this is one of the best examples you can see. And conceptually, this is what we view iliofemoral deep venous thrombosis to be, especially in patients with very symptomatic swollen limbs. And we know we can get rid of the clot, but why didn't the ATTRACT trial and why didn't the CAVA trial show that? Well, we'll try to answer that question, those questions. So when we look at the available randomized trials, we begin with the Scandinavian trial, which was an, a trial of venous thrombectomy versus anticoagulation. And then Al-Shawari looked at catheter-directed thrombolysis in a small group of patients, looking at patency and valve function. And then we have three randomized trials that looked at clinical endpoints, the CAVENT trial, the ATTRACT, and the CAVA trial, the most recent. Now, when we look at the very first trial, venous thrombectomy versus anticoagulation, and Gunnar Plata and his colleagues reported six month, five years, and 10 year follow-up in patients randomized to venous thrombectomy versus anticoagulation, we see significantly improved patency, lower venous pressures, less leg swelling, fewer post-thrombotic symptoms, and those patients randomized to thrombectomy compared to anticoagulation, and these indeed are level one data. However, when subsequently patients like this present classic phlegmasis cerulea dolens treated with heparin for five days, still very painful, unable to ambulate. And ascending phlebograms demonstrate extensive iliofemoral occlusion. We treat these patients today with catheter-based techniques, and appropriately so, because when we lyse, and we know we can lyse acute thrombus quite effectively, and identify an underlying outflow stenosis, as indicated by the arrow, classic May Thurner type anatomy. And I should say that this patient is lying supine and we have access from the popliteal vein 
and you can see when that stenosis is stented and unobstructed venous drainage is provided from the leg into the vena cava. It's a very good radiologic outcome, but it's a very good clinical outcome, and you can see at 12 months, basically, this gentleman has a normal limb, no edema, normal valve function, and he is fully active. And again, the question arises, why didn't we see this in the ATTRACT trial? Why didn't we see this in the CAVA trial? So Al Shawari, in his small number of patients that he randomized to catheter-directed lysis versus anticoagulation, he demonstrated significantly better patency rates and significantly better valve function in patients randomized to lysis versus anticoagulation. But patency and valve function obviously are critically important, but they're not clinical endpoints. And most would agree, however, that if we end up with a patent vein with normal valve function, it's very unlikely that a patient is going to have post-thrombotic syndrome. But nonetheless, post-thrombotic syndrome is the outcome that most of us are interested in. And Tuna Enden and her colleagues from Norway designed the first clinical trial, the KVENT trial, in patients with iliofemoral deep venous thrombosis. And they randomized patients to additional catheter-directed thrombolysis versus standard anticoagulation alone. And their primary endpoint was iliofemoral vein patency at six months and post-thrombotic syndrome at 24 months. And they found that patency was significantly better in those patients randomized to catheter-directed thrombolysis versus anticoagulation and post-thrombotic syndrome at 24 months was significantly less in the patients treated with catheter-directed thrombolysis compared to anticoagulation. And the number needed to treat to prevent one episode of post-thrombotic syndrome at five years was four. Now, for their original publication, the number needed to treat was seven, but that was at 24 months follow-up when they extended their follow-up to five years, as you can see, the patients treated with anticoagulation had progressive deterioration in post-thrombotic morbidity, but not those patients who received catheter-directed thrombolysis, hence the reduction in the number needed to treat. And this is a very efficient treatment if only four patients require treatment to prevent one episode of post-thrombotic syndrome. The next European trial was recently published in Lancet Hematology, and it was known as the CAVA trial, uh, headed up by Pascal Noten and Case Wittens. And their primary efficacy endpoint was any post-thrombotic syndrome at one year, and they had secondary efficacy outcomes, as you can see, and their primary safety outcome was major bleeding. And what they found was in those patients randomized to ultrasound accelerated catheter-directed thrombolysis, their post-thrombotic syndrome at 12 months was 29% in the lytic group, which was really quite good but it's 35% in the standard anticoagulation group, which is very good. And unlike most other observations in any other trial or in clinical practice, we just don't see patients at 65% of those treated with standard anticoagulation have normal limbs. But that's what the observations were, as you can see in this trial. And there was no difference between lysis and standard anticoagulation. But I think these results in the standard anticoagulation group represent surprisingly good outcomes. You can see they had a 5% major bleed rate with uh, lytic therapy and a surprisingly large 13% instant thrombosis rate with lysis. They had a robust evaluation for quality of life, but they could find no difference in quality of life between the two groups. So the conclusion was the addition of ultrasound accelerated 
catheter-directed thrombolysis did not reduce the risk of post-thrombotic syndrome, nor did it alter the patient's quality of life. But I want to spend just a little bit more time on the ATTRACT trial because it is the most robust uh, trial published to date. Uh, the original uh, paper was published in the New England Journal at the end of 2017. It was an NIH-sponsored trial, randomized, controlled, multi-center, assessor-blinded, 692 patients randomized. Importantly, I need to emphasize that these patients were stratified by the extent of their thrombus before they were randomized. Hence, iliofemoral DVT was stratified versus femoral popliteal DVT. And patients were randomized one-to-one to, -one to, to uh, pharmacomechanical catheter-directed thrombolysis plus anticoagulation or anticoagulation alone, which was the control group. And here you can see the algorithm, those patients coming into the trial with symptomatic proximal DVT were stratified first to iliofemoral DVT versus FEMPOP DVT, and then they were randomized. So this, this permits a dedicated analysis of both the iliofemoral DVT patients and femoral popliteal DVT patients without compromise. And the primary efficacy outcome was any post-thrombotic syndrome at 24 months. I doubt we would choose this endpoint today, but that's the endpoint that was chosen when the protocol was written. And I helped write the protocol when the protocol was written around 2006, 2000, uh, 2007. We also had very important secondary efficacy outcomes, which was the severity of post-thrombotic syndrome, the number of patients with moderate and severe post-thrombotic syndrome, pain, swelling, and quality of life. However, the primary outcome, no difference between the two groups, as you can see, 47% in the PCDT group, 48% anticoagulation alone. There was a 1.7% risk of major bleeds compared to 0.3% in the control group, and the p-value there was significant. But the real question is, do these results accurately reflect the severity of the disease when the patient came into the trial? So what I mean is this example. This is one of our patients that we admitted into the trial, 34-year-old woman, long automobile trip, taking birth control pills, and she had symptoms of swelling, discomfort, heaviness in her right leg, as you can see, for six days. And a duplex demonstrated a fair amount of clot in her femoral popliteal system, but thrombus, non-occlusive thrombus extending well into the common femoral vein. So therefore, this patient qualifies as iliofemoral deep venous thrombosis. So she accepted the ATTRACT trial, and she consented to the ATTRACT trial. And then the paperwork was completed, and it was found that her Velalta score was four, which means normal. Four or less is a normal Velalta score. So if we're hoping to achieve a normal Velalta score, this patient has already achieved that before entry into the trial. And of course, a threshold Velalta score was not part of the criterion for entry into the trial nor do I think it was part of the criterion for entry into any of the other trials. And then when we look at the data for the ATTRACT, overall 18% of the patients randomized to ATTRACT had a normal Velalta score at entry. An additional 35% had a mild Velalta score at entry, and I would submit that it's difficult to improve upon this when we're dealing in a clinical trial that is hoping to achieve a low Volta score. So in the tract, 53% of the subjects had a normal or mild Volta score at entry. But the reality is that 
catheter-based strategies of thrombus removal really are focused and predominantly in patients with iliofemoral D-venous thrombosis. So analysis of the iliofemoral patients versus femoral popliteal patients may give us some additional insight. And we did publish the femoral popliteal DVT uh, data, and I'll just summarize by saying there was no benefit in patients who were randomized to PCDT, not even a signal of benefit, but there was an increased risk of major bleed, 3% versus 1.8% in those patients randomized to catheter-directed thrombolysis. And then we went on to evaluate the patients with iliofemoral deep venous thrombosis, of which there were 391 patients, so a robust group. Again, the primary endpoint, any post-thrombotic syndrome, and major bleeding, the primary safety endpoint, and the important, very important clinical secondary endpoint. And I would submit, I do believe the secondary endpoints are more clinically relevant than the primary endpoint. But we can see that there was no difference. Even in the oleofemoral DBT group, in those patients randomized to PCDT versus control, 49% versus 51%. That's using the Volalta score. However, if we had chosen, if we had chosen to use the venous clinical severity score, we would have a positive endpoint. That is a significant difference in patients randomized to PCDT versus the control patients, as you can see, the p-value 0.034. But we didn't choose the venous clinical severity score. We chose the Volalta score. But even with the Volalta score, we see that at the end of the trial, there was a significant reduction in the severity of the Volalta score in the PCDT groups. When we look at patients having moderate to severe post-thrombotic syndrome, we can see a significant reduction in those randomized to catheter-based techniques versus anticoagulation alone. And indeed, the control patients had a 56% increased risk of moderate to severe post-thrombotic syndrome versus uh, PCDT. And there was a significant reduction in severe post-thrombotic syndrome in patients who were randomized to PCDT versus control patients. And that stands whether you use the Volalta score or the venous clinical severity score. And when we look at those data, we see that the control patients, the anticoagulated patients alone, had a 72% increased risk of severe post-thrombotic syndrome compared to the pharmacomechanical catheter-directed thrombolysis group. There was an increased risk of major bleeding, 1.5% versus 0.5% in the control group, but this uh, was a historically low risk of major bleeds with PCDT, and there were no intracranial bleeds. There was a significant reduction in pain. There was a significant reduction in edema in those patients randomized to PCDT and there was a significant improvement in disease-specific quality of life in our iliofemoral DVT patients treated with catheter-directed thrombolysis. So compared to no PCDT, the PCDT patients resulted in significant reduction of any post-thrombotic syndrome if we used the venous clinical severity score a reduction in moderate and severe post-thrombotic syndrome, a reduction in severe post-thrombotic syndrome, reduction in pain and swelling, and an improved disease-specific quality of life compared to the anticoagulation controls with an historically low risk of major bleeding. So to answer the question, who to take to the cath lab in those patients with extensive deep venous thrombosis, well, certainly patients with iliofemoral DVT who present with signs and symptoms resulting in a Volalta score of nine or more 
pardon me, of greater than nine, of 10 or more. And if the score, if the Vuelta score is not 10, we just need to adjust our expectations for what the endpoints would be after catheter-based techniques or focus on other important endpoints, which might well be achiness, might well be limitations of activity, because some of these patients will have reasonably good-looking legs but still be limited by pain on walking because of the ambulatory venous hypertension that resides and hence be left with venous claudication. So I want to uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks for joining this educational program. I hope this has provided some insight from the clinical trials and how we translate those trial data to clinical practice. Thanks again.